I should throw a coat on. I'm gonna throw a coat on. He's gonna be off. He's out of control. Oh, you're crushing me. Try it. I said that's what I'm seeing. All right. Okay, ready. Hey guys, my name is Lieutenant Jason Haley uh, from Station Six, Engine Six. Craig Stalloway, Firefighter Ladder Six. Today we're going to be talking about mastering the basics of search with also an emphasis on the importance of venting while we search. We're talking about the statistics of victim survivability and we are hoping to enhance the search culture here. So the importance of getting inside quickly and then once we get inside where are we going based on the statistics of where our victims are at. Uh, lastly we're going to be touching on victim removal techniques and thermal imaging camera use. So at this point, we're gonna go and we're gonna demonstrate everything. <laughs> All right guys, before we get started, we wanna talk about the in route mindset that officers need to have and firefighters need to have. Oftentimes we get in this mindset of, we hear nothing showing on the radio. And when we hear nothing showing, then we all kind of slow down our thought process a little bit and we're not staying sharp. We need to try to remain in that mindset of there is a fire, there are victims. I promise you that if we keep in that mindset, we'll all be better because of it. And the other thing to consider is that uh, this is a free opportunity to us to get a rep in for training. If this is not a real fire and it truly is nothing showing, it truly is nothing, but we've flushed a hydrant, we've connected to a hydrant, we've prepared to lay in, and we, we play out the scenario as if it's real, when it is real, we'll be completely ready for that. So a search size up should happen after the crew gets off the rig and they're getting prepared to conduct a primary search. So this can include officers, firefighters, engineers, anybody making entry that's gonna be a part of the search team needs to conduct the search size up. And this is a very brief process. This should take no more than 10 to 15 seconds to conduct. And the goal with it is to give you an idea of where we're gonna start our search and some safety considerations that we need to be mindful of when we do our search. So there's four things that we need to cover with the search size up. One of those is safety. We need to identify the location of the fire. We also need to identify location of victims. And we need to take a look at some of the construction features. And this includes egress points and where our bedrooms are located at. So we'll take a closer look at some of these items and uh, give you a better idea of what this looks like. Here we go. Because time is incredibly important when we're conducting search operations, again, this assessment, this search size up or per search profile should be very quick. So the easiest, fastest way to do this is to have uh, members that are approaching the structure, let's say it's two searchers. They're going to take a look at the alpha side of the structure and then one will peel off to Bravo and then one will peel off to Delta. And this, again, this takes a few seconds to kind of get an idea of what conditions we have on each side so that we can at least get three sides of the structure prior to making entry. So again, let's review what the four steps are with our size up. Uh, the first one is safety. So what are we looking at for safety? The main thing we're looking for are basement fire conditions, attic fire conditions. We're also taking a look at our conditions where we're making entry. If we have significant, heavy, dark black smoke, hot smoke that fills the majority of the door opening, we need to be thinking about having a hose line in place when we search, if we have near flashover conditions. In addition to that, we need to consider VES. If uh, making entry through the alpha side of the structure is gonna have some any delay in getting to the bedrooms or areas where uh, victims are most likely to be found, we need to consider VES as a primary option because it's incredibly fast. Location of fire is mainly just our smoke and fire conditions. If we see uh, any smoke and fire in any part of the structure, we need to look at the uh, smoke color, velocity, and intensity coming out of that part of the building. And we obviously need to let our host team know that that's uh, the possible location of the fire. Okay, so let's talk about location of victims. Our best resource for this are gonna be bystanders on scene. If they can identify last known location of victims inside, we should focus our search in those areas. However, this information isn't always reliable and some of the numbers show us this. With 28% of victims found on primary searches, were not reported at all. And 5% were reported to be out of the structure entirely. In addition to those numbers, we need to start looking about where these victims are found on primary searches, because that really is where we should be concentrating our efforts for search as a whole. 
42% of victims found are found in bedrooms, 12% of victims found are found in hallways, and 10% of victims found are found within six feet of an exterior door. So obviously these aren't absolutes, but they're an important starting place and they're the most likely places that we're gonna find saveable life. Because this is a brief size up, we're not doing a, a very in-depth process with this. We're basically looking for where the bedrooms are to help us identify where we're gonna start our search in addition to egress points. So those are the main things we're looking at prior to making entry. Okay, so the last part of our search size up is making decisions. So we're gonna call that our search priority. So where are we gonna go now that we've assessed our situation? So many of us were trained that uh, we start searching the most affected areas first, followed by the areas with the largest number of victims, then other areas in the hazard zone, Lastly, uh, areas that are exposed to the fire. And so this is still true with uh, the methods that we operate in. However, there's some important caveats that we need to talk about with this. First is uh, whether or not we know the location of the fire. So if the fire location is unknown, then both the engine company and the search team are gonna make all efforts to find the seat of the fire and they're gonna search out from that point. If the location of the fire is known, then the engine company will make their way to that fire and they're gonna search along the way. So they're effectively covering the area, the most threatened area first. The search team will then go to the areas that were statistically most likely to find victims, which mainly include bedrooms. So you're gonna see a split in that. And that ensures that we cover the most ground quickly to find victims. There's a lot of unknowns going to a fire. Layout, location of the fire, where the victims are at. So we need to control the times that we can in preparation for the times that we can. The survivability rate of our victims on the inside drops by 10% every two minutes. So we can make up time on the front end by mask up times under 20 seconds, by getting to the rig as fast as possible, getting efficient with our ladder work, getting efficient with our forcible entry. All that stuff we can do before the actual event. One thing that I think all of us can get better at is getting inside faster by masking up faster. I'm just gonna give you my own personal way of doing it and how I get off the rig. I get off the rig with my fire gloves on, so that way I can go to work right away. I also keep my mask hooked up to my regulator because I think that it adds efficiency. Uh, I like to take my helmet off. I'll pass my mask through my helmet strap I'll basically just drop my helmet on my arm. I keep my mask set up so I never have to touch these three straps. I only have to touch these bottom two. Mask up. Now I'll pull my straps back to tighten my mask and then I'm automatically ready, automatically ready to just pinch a piece of fabric Find, uh, find it with my thumb, and then I can work that around. Make sure it's tight on my mask. Next, put my helmet on, tighten it down. to the door and this is going to be for everybody not just ladder or engine companies when we get to any door we're going to get down low below the thermal line, and we're going to look back we're going to look for three things we're going to look for life fire and layout okay <clears throat> so life 10 percent of our victims are found within six feet of an exterior door so automatically we're just looking for an easy grab fire if we can see where the fire is at 
and before we get the hose lies, lines in, disturb the thermal layering, uh, we might be able to see where the fire is or where, where it might be coming from. We'll tell the engine company real easy, hey, it's down 20 feet to your right. And the last thing's gonna be layout. Again, before we disturb that layering, maybe we can get a good scan of these rooms to see where the stairs are, where the bedrooms might be. Uh, did our outside search profile match what we're seeing in here? So from our outside search profile, we should have a good idea of when we get inside this room, which way we're gonna be going. So far, we, we know from our search profile that the uh, bedrooms are gonna be off to the left once we get inside. So I know that I'm gonna be heading towards that direction. So we have two options. We have an anchored search or an oriented search. An anchored search is you are anchored to something, a wall, a hose line, a rope, which is great for low, vis low visibility. You have that <clears throat> anchor so that if something goes south, you know exactly where you're at to get outside the door. If you have a medium or low smoke conditions, you can use an orientated search. So you're not necessarily anchored to anything. You are orientated to the space. So I know that for my search profile, I have at least one big window here and I have another one inside the other room. Um, so you're orientated to your exit points. So now we're gonna talk about how we're actually gonna search. The query is always a question of, should I be standing? Should I be duck walking? Should I actually get down on my knee and actually move around? It's kind of an old adage of, if I can see my feet, I can walk. Well, I think there's a little bit of validity to that, but none of our victims are up here. They're all down low. And an inch of visibility is worth a mile of work. So if I can get down on a knee, I can search way more effectively, way more thoroughly if I can see. So we're, we're gonna get low. If you can see inside this house right now, this would be considered a high visibility situation. So I can walk in that high visibility. So almost no smoke at all. If there's even just a little bit of smoke or a lot of smoke, that's the lower we're gonna get. We're either gonna get down, <clears throat> walk through and move through like this, or we're gonna get down in what's considered a tripod position. Tripod position, we're gonna have one knee up, one knee down. It's incredibly effective, it's quick, it keeps our weight a little bit farther back. So as we're moving, if we were to come across a hole or anything like that, our weight's back. As opposed to this method, where most of our weight is forward and it's really hard to see the conditions. So we're gonna get in that tripod position. <clears throat> as we're searching, uh, I'm gonna have my tool with me. I'm gonna use that just to move, and then when I'm ready to search, I'm gonna sprawl out and I'm gonna use my hand. I'm not gonna search with the tool. As you can see, my tool's right where my leg and my, uh, right on my ankle. So I always know where it's at. But I'm gonna spread out, I'm actually gonna feel for things. I'm not gonna pat, because I don't know what I'm hitting. I'm gonna feel for things. If I come across a big pile of clothes, I'm gonna work my hands through that pile of clothes. I'm gonna be real tactile. So then when I'm ready to move again, pop up. Now I'm ready to move around. I get to another threshold, but I do the same thing. I'm gonna look for my light fire lamp. Fire department, anybody in here? There's a door. I'm gonna go into the room, search behind the door, right? Because 10% of our victims are gonna be found within that six feet. So I wanna make sure I check that entire six feet. I'm gonna move into this room. Again, I'm on an orientated search, okay? I'm orientated by the windows that I saw on the outside and what I'm finding in here. So if I find a couch or I find a uh, like lazy boy, I know that I'm inside the living room. Those are living room things. So how I'm gonna search this is take my hands and I'm going to feel all the parts of it. Again, I'm not doing this thing because you can't figure out what you're actually touching. You feel the entire thing. Again, I'm still using my hands, but I have my my tool with me at all times. I want to feel to the back of this. If there's if I can not feel a wall or anything, I know that I need to go back and search that. But we need to think about where the people are going to be. Okay. 
<clears throat> are they going to be crammed up inside a corner under a bunch of stuff? Probably not, not if they're an adult. Um, so look for the low hanging fruit. Look for the couches, chairs, beds. That's usually where people are going to be at. We talked about the importance of getting inside as fast as we can. So we can cut down time by our mask up times, efficiency with our ladder work, efficiency with our forcible entry. There's some other different types of search tactics that we can use to get to them faster. Uh, two of which being a split search and obviously VES. VES is gonna get us to the bedrooms faster than anything else because we don't have to mess around with trying to find stairs to get upstairs or worrying about layout. We are targeting the, ba the bedrooms from the outside. Now it's not a tactic we're gonna use all the time because it's not appropriate all the time. It's appropriate when it's going to take a really long time or maybe it's impossible to get to those bedrooms from the inside because there's some inherent risks with that VES. You're opening up a flow path. Maybe you can't get to a door fast enough to close it uh, to make conditions change. Split search is going to be when normally you'd have a anchor at the door while one firefighter goes to search. Well, a split search is always on the same level, you're never switching, but those two firefighters who are searching, let's just take the rooms behind me, for example, in a moderate smoke condition, so not super heavy, not high heat, um, when they can move a little bit more quickly, you could have two firefighters searching two rooms at once, then coming back out, regrouping, and moving down. So you're, you don't always have that anchor when you're doing a split search. Why that's important is because you can search twice the amount of space in half the time. This is Corey Riedel from Engine 6. Today we're going to go over searching specifically bedrooms, how to search beds, cribs, and then also how to vent windows. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to start searching behind this door as I close it. So as I close it, searching behind the door, and I'm, I'm isolated in this room, so now I can take my tool with me, come up to the window. If it's Low visibility, I'm going to take the window and the sash. If it's moderate and or high visibility, you can just slide the, the window open and take the screen out. Once you have that vented, I usually drop the tool back by the door and I'll start searching the bed. So I'm going to come here, I'm going to search on top of the bed. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lift my arms up, see if there's a bunk bed above me. If there is, I'm going to search that top bunk bed because that's where the heat is. When you're searching beds, you want to actually get up on the bed and search this back crack and this top crack because kids can fall down inside. So I'm going to search every part of this. And then I'm going to actually also search underneath the bed. Next, I'm going to come over to this crib. And with the crib, you're going to search, you're going to pull the crib towards you. First reason is you don't want to pull the kid up and bring him into that smoke. And the other reason is when you pull the crib towards you, all the bedding, everything, including the patient, will come down right to your lap. So you can search this really easily. Make sure that you find the victim and there's not multiple victims inside this crib. And then you can head out. Hey, I'm David Thomas. I'm on Ladder 6. We're going to go over a couple of victim removal techniques today. Um, the big three are going to be low visibility, moderate visibility, and high visibility. Um, the first one is going to be low visibility. Um, the big one about this is we want to keep their head out of that, um, out of the atmosphere that's going to kill them. So keep their head down and their feet first. So what we do is we come up, using our strong leg muscles, we grab them under here. And the good thing about this is it keeps their head down out of the smoke. The other thing is when I start dragging him back, his arms will automatically go back to cover his head. So when we go around corners, um, he'll protect his head that way. So that's gonna be our low visibility drag. All right, now our next one, we're gonna go over um, a victim removal with moderate visibility. Um, so the smoke isn't as banked down, so we can bring his head up a little bit. This is gonna be our team drag. Our partner, Craig, is gonna do a basic EMS carry from behind. We're gonna do wet inside leg over coming under his, um, under his knees, just like that. 
And we're gonna go, ready, go. And we're gonna carry him out. You can also do this technique, um, one person if you need to, outside foot or inside foot out, looking at him this time. And you pick him up. And the good thing about this, you can do your 180 degree spin and then take him out the front door. So very easy there. Again, keeping his head out of that smoke. Um, high visibility, so no smoke problems. We're gonna come up behind him, reach under, grabbing their wrist so their arms don't flail up. Again, doing a good deadlift, picking them up, and out we go. That's when it's when there's no smoke and we don't need to worry about the, uh, the atmosphere. So the next victim removal technique we're gonna go over is our low visibility and high heat. Um, this is where we need our patient's head to be as low to the ground as we can. Um, as well, we can't just stand up, um, so we need to be low as well. So we're gonna do, you can come between their legs, called the head down feet first method. You're gonna come under his knees and grab and do a good squat position. And my partner is gonna lead me out because I can't look behind me. The other benefit of this is his arms will flail above him, protecting his head around corners. All right, the last victim removal technique we're gonna go over is actually using your webbing. Um, this should be your last resort or if you have a long, long drag through a warehouse or something like that. Uh, the reason being, webbing can be in low visibility, very tough to use, um, hard to manage. Um, so it should be a last resort. You should be able to use uh, the other techniques before this. But if it's a long drag and you need to use it, grab your webbing. We're gonna do quick movements. So we're gonna go a girth hitch through the leg leading with our carabiner, our working end, throw, grabbing his leg, throwing it over his body, picking him up. And now we have two handles right here. And this can pick him up and we can drag. Super fast, super simple. Okay, now we're gonna talk about first two officer roles and responsibilities. We've completed our 360. We've identified the location of the fire, hopefully. Now we're gonna make our way to the front door. I personally like to get ahead of the hose line or ahead of my search team so that I can see an undisturbed visual and feeling of what this fire is actually doing. I'm gonna suck carpet. I'm gonna determine live fire layout. I'm gonna take my tick and I'm gonna quickly scan the room. Now I'm gonna make my way ahead of the hose line and search team. At this point, I wanna identify my five red flags. High heat, low visibility, un unable to locate the seat of the fire, spongy floors, which means a basement fire, and hoarder conditions. Now, how are, we gonna, how are we, gonna, we gonna respond to these five conditions? For high heat, low visibility, unable to locate the seat of the fire, we need to perform vertical vent. After vertical vent has been completed, keep in mind we have a two minute window before conditions get worse to be able to find the seat of the fire. For hoarder conditions, we have to just be on a heightened sense of awareness. We have to know that we're in a dangerous situation. And for spongy floors, which means a basement fire that's been unidentified, we might want to consider emergency radio traffic and withdrawing from the structure. Next thing we're going to talk about is venting wall research. UL studies have shown that flow path is a legit concern, but there are two ways that we could effectively overcome this with venting wall research. The first way is we're going to make our way into an area, shut a door behind us, and vent the window. This is gonna drastically in increase the victim's survivability by decreasing smoke quickly. The other way we're gonna do this is gonna be by as soon as we hear that the fire is under control, then we just open up and vent the surrounding windows to also increase the victim's survivability and decrease the smoke. Right. Last part of this training, we're gonna quickly review tick operations. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, aren't quite familiar with tick operations and how they truly work. One of the things that we're going to go over real quick is a lot of people have gone through fires and they've said they get a white out screen on their thermal imaging camera. One of the ways that you could eliminate that is with these toggles. This is covered by a sticker right here, but using these toggles that adjusts the heat rating in the, with the thermal imaging camera. So it actually turns it to blue. So you can see what your object is gonna be. Is it gonna be blue or white, depending on where, what heat setting it goes to. But when the screen is all white, that means it's really hot in there. 
adjust the heat setting. Another thing to keep in mind is thermal imaging cameras read the surface temperatures only. So we're gonna go into here and I'm gonna look here and then what you're seeing right here is it's, you can see Dave Thomas is gonna be his head and his arms, but you can't tell that there's a body underneath there because this, the blanket that's covering him hasn't read that yet. So as we go in here, you can see the difference. You can see the difference here. This is reading surface temperatures only. So it's not going to see through there that there's a body underneath there. So when we're doing this, we cannot rule out because we don't see a body. We cannot rule out the fact that there's a person in there. Only rely on this thermal imaging camera to scan a room quickly and then to, to find a person quickly, but that doesn't mean there's no one in, the, in there. So that's just a quick overview of thermal imaging cameras. Lucky,